Hello. Welcome to episode number 67 of CXO Talk. I'm Michael Krigsman, and here with my friendly co-host, Vala Offshore. Vala! Michael, good to see you. <laughs> fist bump. A fist, we did a fist bump that no one can see. Absolutely. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> and uh, we're here today with Vala. We are here today with some would consider one of the leading online technology community builder, a technology futurist, a best-selling author, blogger, and someone who has probably the coolest title, one that I would love to have someday, which is a startup liaison officer. So we're here with uh, great Robert Scoville. How are you, Robert? Doing really well. Thanks for having <laughs> me on. Really honored. I mean, I, I've been uh, looking through the list of people who've been on the show. It's really, uh, really pretty crazy. Well, can you tell us? I mean, I, I tell you, Michael, isn't that the coolest title? A the startup, startup liaison, liaison exactly. officer. So, I mean, so, what, so what is what is that? What is that? Do? Well, really, what they asked me to do is study the future. So, uh, for people who don't know what Rackspace is, cloud computing company, we're underneath like TED uh, or Oakley or Pabst Beer. Uh, we're the plumbing underneath um, a lot of these famous websites. Um, and they asked me to go and and study where the future is going, so that they're not blindsided or broadsided by it. <laughs> That's fascinating. And so, how do you so how do you do that? You, you you talk with startups or how do you Yeah, I'm doing just what you're doing with me. I go around the world and interview tech executives and last night I was hanging out here at a, a VIP party in Los Angeles. I'm here in Los Angeles this weekend and um, uh, was talking to Mike Shinoda who runs the uh, band Lincoln Park and hearing his uh, uh, a view on the industry, you know. So I get around the world and I uh, uh, try to meet as many people as I can, mostly innovators, people who are running startups, because those are typically the people who are pushing the future. You know, you don't usually hear about something really crazy uh, as uh, starting at an enterprise and then coming to consumer. So I, we study it the reverse way around. So uh, I mentioned you're, you know, an unbelievable blogger and incredible influence covering future technology. You're also an author, and uh, you recently co-authored a book called yeah. Age of Context with Shell Israel, and uh, it was about smart, forward-thinking companies and what they're doing in terms of improving contextual intelligence, and again, the title was Age of Context. Can yeah. you talk to us about what is context and why is it so important, and when did we enter the age of, of, of context? Well, I think the iPhone really brought the age. Uh, you know that that was the first smartphone that a lot of us were carrying around that had uh, a, an easy to use interface and a bunch of applications that could talk to the sensors that are in the mobile phone. I think really that was a, a huge shift in what kind of computing we could do because that before then uh, Bill Gates ran the world and and uh, he made software that ran on a desktop computer or a laptop. I mean I, when I worked at Microsoft. It, the vision was still put a computer on every desk and in, in every home. You know, now it's changed a little bit because they've pretty much done that. So now they're uh, trying to get it back into the mobile world, which they really did miss. They, uh, you know, in the United States, they have about four percent market share. Um, but what, what's really happened is uh, we now are carrying our computer, you know, a device like this, and it, on that device it has sensors. Uh, which can know where it, where you are. That's a little bit of context. And then if you look at things like Google Now, Google Now looks at your email and your calendar and even the Internet and even the Internet of Things. So if you walk next to a Nest thermostat, it might, uh, Google Now might say, uh, hey, would you like to take control of your Nest thermostat? You know, something like that. Um, so, so, so anyway, so the book is about sensors and wearable computers, which is the next uh, wave of things coming. Uh, combined with social network data, location network, and when you fuse those uh, uh, four things together, plus big data, um, you can make a new kind of computing system, a contextual operating system, one that knows where you are, potentially who you're with, like I'm here at the Ritz uh, in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, that makes my context very different than when I'm home. You know? Sure, sure. So it's uh, so the four things are so social, mobile, data, and sensors. Is that it? Social, mobile, wearable, wearables, which is really mobile plus. You know, because soon we're going to be wearing watches. I have a couple of, around here, or something on our face, or something on mm -hmm. our shirt. 
you know, I, I saw uh, at the wearable Wednesday the other night, uh, somebody had a little pendant, which is made for uh, people to, uh, if they touch it three times, it'll uh, call the police because then maybe they're in trouble and they can't get to their phone, something like that. Wow. So, um, um, where where it is is the fusion though. That's where the magic was for this book. Mm -hmm. The five things all have books on it. You know, the the Internet of Things has a book. Wearables should have like three or four books in. Um, you know, a social network. We had a book uh, eight eight years ago called Age. Uh, I'm sorry, Naked Conversations, which was all about how blogging was being used by corporations. Um, and and then location data, uh, Foursquare, Ways, uh, Facebook check-ins, Google Maps, Apple Maps, Navtech, on and on. There's a lot of data about where we are all of a sudden. That was not true when we were, wrote our first book eight years ago. Sure. So Salesforce uh, CEO Mark Benioff, I believe, wrote the forward for your book, yeah. Age of Context, and and certainly a company that's been talking about mobile, social apps, data. Do you think Salesforce is positioning themselves to be maybe the default platform, especially with the Internet of Things and sensors, in terms of capturing all this stuff and delivering insight to the enterprise and, and the consumer? Yeah. Mark is very good. And actually, one of the reasons I wrote the book was to try to get ahead of Mark, because I noticed what he does is at his big Dreamforce conference that has you know 100,000 people at it, he, uh, he, he sort of comes out and says, oh, uh, Salesforce is now for X. You know, he, in fact, he just announced a bunch of wearable stuff uh, a week ago. So I'm sure, sure, uh, this year when we go to Dreamforce, he's going to say Salesforce is for the mobile worker who's <laughs> wearing things, you know, or something. The wearable worker. <laughs> yeah. And and really, what he does is signal where his company is going to catch up over the next year, and then the customers of his are really uh, going to have uh, use that stuff two or three years later. And so he's really a brilliant marketer. He, he sets in everybody's head, oh, Salesforce is going to be in the wearable space. And then uh, two, two years later, when everybody's wearing an Apple Watch at, at work or a Google Watch, um, you know, he's ready. <laughs> you know? And so, I, um, yeah, they're, they're pretty well positioned. If you look at the positioning, they're really well positioned. If you look at the uh, actual code and what they actually do, uh, they have a lot of work to do. Sure. Sure. So the uh, so a lot of the things that you're talking about are very future oriented, but tell us tell us about context today in 2004 at this point in 2014. What are some of the more interesting examples? Well, there's a whole bunch of them. I, you know, I, I look at mobile uh, apps and uh, talk to the people building mobile apps and building the sensors even for mobile phones. You know. We, we, uh, this year we got a fingerprint sensor on our phone. Well, that was interesting, but the cameras are getting sharper, the, the microphones are getting better, the uh, accelerometers that are in the uh, phones are getting better, right? And so now we saw a company like Moves, and very few people use Moves or know what Moves is, but Moves is a mobile app um, that Facebook just bought. And Moves already knows whether you're walking, running, uh, driving, or biking, just by watching the sensors on your phone, nothing else. And uh, so that might be interesting to a future version of Facebook. It, it, it might just start the post for you automatically. Hey, I was running, <laughs> you know, along the beach in Half Moon Bay. Well, it could write that for you, <laughs> and then you fill in the details, you know, and your, your post is already half done, which uh, means that there's going to be more posts, which uh, helps Facebook's uh, business model out, right? Wow. Um, yeah. I, I thought I read you had mentioned that some of the sensor technology that you get to see well in advance of any of us could be as much as eight to ten years away from being product ready yeah, and yeah, in the yeah. consumer hands. And when I read that, I was wondering, wow, eight to ten, what is preventing this incredible well, innovation to go mainstream? It's the same way. When you first saw the first Wi-Fi radios, they were uh, a big computer like this big, you know? <laughs> And, and now it's a little tiny piece of your fingernail, you know, <laughs> that, that same radio. So it's shrunk down in size and got dramatically cheaper and dramatically faster, okay. you know, over the last decade or 15 years since Wi-Fi really was introduced. And so if you want to know where the world is going to be in, in around 15 years, you do the same thing. You say, well, what is this big today? Well, I, I visited SRI, a research famous research lab in uh, uh, Menlo Park. They invented the Internet <laughs> and Siri and... Uh, 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 digital surgery and a, a whole bunch of other things, 
and they showed me a sensor that can tell whether you have pancreatic cancer or not just by looking at a little piece of your blood, a little drop of your blood. And um, uh, so that sensor today is, is pretty big and pretty expensive. Uh, you take that 15 years from now, and it's going to be something that sits on your skin underneath a watch or something. Wow. Robert, we have a question from Twitter, from Vishwas Monral, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, and if not, I apologize. But he asks, Scobalizer, you, Robert wants to talk to startups, but how can startups contact him? How can My, That is pretty easy. My phone number is on the internet. It's plus one, four, two, five, two, zero, five, nineteen, twenty-one, and it has been on the internet for eight years. And my email is scobalizer at gmail, so it's pretty easy to get a hold of me. The real question shouldn't be how do you talk to me, because I'll talk to pretty much anybody. Uh, the real question is how do you get uh, how do you get to the top of the industry, which is really where you want to be. You know, um, uh, I just met with one of the Y Combinator companies that's going to be uh, uh, graduating in, in the next few months, and there's 84 companies in just Y Combinator. So and and there's dozens of incubators or it's like like Y Combinator that are kicking out a, a large number of companies. So how do you get to be noticed? When you're one of the 84, and the press, the, the press all goes to Y Combinator, right? The TechCrunch goes, a, a whole bunch of uh, uh, different company, different brands, news brands go, but they can only cover five or ten companies out of those 84. So that's the that's the real question. How do you get noticed? How do you uh, how do you uh, 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 get to be uh, important? So how? I, oh. If I if I knew, I'd start a company. <laughs> <laughs> That's like that's like asking a, a a psychic. Why don't you buy lottery tickets? <laughs> well, everybody everybody wants to to know. So so let's just talk about in your case, okay? People pitch you endlessly. As a matter of fact, if somebody sends you an email, your automatic reply back says, "Sorry, I can only I read everything, but I can only respond to five percent of the incoming emails." Yeah. So what gets your attention? Uh, if all my friends say, "Oh my God, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen," you know, or particularly if somebody is good at doing that, uh, Ron Conway or or um, uh, Esther Dyson, you know, these are people who have been doing it for decades. And and uh, Ron Conway was one of the first investors in Google, for instance. Google's a good example, actually. And this, when I sit down with entrepreneurs and they're going into a crowded space, like, like uh, Google went into search engines, they were the 17th search engine, and everybody in the industry thought, "Oh, Alta Vista has this thing locked up. You know, <laughs> it's done. <laughs> you know, let's move on to something else." No, no, no. Google came out and it, and and we very quickly figured out, "Oh, it's not done," <laughs> and and that's a lesson. Uh, Google was. Uh, told me just simply try try your favorite search and it took 20 seconds and I said there's no porn here how did you do that and uh, because Alta Vista always had porn in the result set when I did when I did my favorite search and that led to an hour-long discussion of what page rank was and how, how Google was gonna make this happen and how they figured out how to do it and that and that's really what you have to do you have to have something so much better than all the other players that I can get it in about 20 seconds. And if it takes you 15 minutes to explain why you're better, it ain't going to happen because uh, people are are too resistant to change. If if they can get it in 20 seconds, you have a shot. Wow, that's amazing. Um, I want to shift a little bit. You know, we've talked about wearable technology and potentially entering a second wave with sensors and shirts and in and, and all sorts of places. Uh, my company was working with a startup that's focusing on Google Glass. Yeah. And, um, you know, the... Was, the it, was, it, was it a vertical market startup, like aimed at surgeons or something like that, or is it aimed at... at Cloud Optics was the name of the company. Yeah. And um, what, we, what they're looking at is capturing analytics from Glass and, um, and, and being able to stream glass to glass. And uh, so one case study yeah. was... You have a referee in a rugby match, and you're streaming the referee's view through glass to other glass wearers, and also you're capturing analytics in terms of where you're looking, because you know as you're in a stadium, if you can capture 
data in terms of where everyone is looking, you can now intelligently market to companies in terms of where digital signage could potentially go. Yeah. Uh, so again, if you can say better than 50% uh, of the time, everyone's looking here, this is a perfect placement for you to put your ad. Well, um, let, let's, let's take it away from ads, because I, I, I hate the discussion of ads, because it, it takes people off the discussion of utility. And, it, sure. and if this thing has no utility, you won't have ads, because right. you won't have any users. <laughs> That's yeah. right. So if you have utility, and I... Right now, Google Glass does not have enough utility. I, I have a pair, and I keep trying it out. I, I wore it for almost a year, and it just doesn't have enough utility to for me to tell my dad, oh, my God, you got to go buy one. Right. Certainly not enough utility to get to over the $1,500 price point that they're selling right. them at right now. Um, but let's say, let's say it did get to the utility, and the price came down, and, and all of a sudden I was like, Every, everybody should have one of these. Um, Imagine walking into a football stadium and, and, and walking down the stairs to your seat, and it shows you all sorts of stats about who's on the field. That would be cool. And if you knew where it's aimed, you could do that, right? The, the TV cameras already do that. They put lines on the field for you, and, the, and they do other kinds of stats. At the uh, America's Cup, when there was a sailing race right on the bay, did, did you watch that? Because uh, they showed the uh, the tide patterns because they had wow. sensors of the tide, and they showed the wind pattern, and they showed the 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 uh, where the boat was and and who was sailing faster and stuff like that. That made the sport a lot more fun to watch. Absolutely. So imagine having something on your face that you're you're at a football game and you're watching the guy running down the field and it's telling you how fast he is going and how fast <laughs> the other guy's going. You you know right away he's going to score a touchdown because. You can sort of see that, but it, you're going to have the data right. really quickly. It, it, uh, in fact, uh, at CES this year, I saw a sensor that the NFL players are going to be wearing, partly to help their, the, them with figure out this uh, concussion problem that they right. have. They have a, a real health problem where people are getting hit so, so much in their head that they're having uh, health issues later on, and it's costing the, the league a PR problem and a money problem. So they're trying to figure out how to fix that with sensors. But the sensors are also going to be streaming data live to the TV cameras. So you're going to have a lot of – when somebody does get hit, you're going to know how hard that hit was. You're going to know how fast they were running. You're going to know uh, how many uh, miles have they run in the game, something like that. I mean, imagine uh, World Cup in four years. You're going to have so much data streaming oh, yeah. off of the players, yeah. But when Zuckerberg, in March, when they bought Oculus Rift, I thought at the press event, he talked about imagine courtside experience delivered through augmented reality. Yeah. Wouldn't Google streaming from glass to glass be a good utility example? Or, or, or? Well, uh, what I think Oculus is working on, and, and they're working on it with Samsung, is a version that's going to be very low cost that okay. you put your phone into, and the phone uh, becomes the, the projection screen, and then oh. you have uh, lenses that look at it. So they can display uh, stuff uh, uh, to you that way. And the, the, the version I've seen is actually um, a, a startup's coming out with a foam one that you put your iPhone into, and it has a hole for your camera. So it can see the real world and display that on your, on your face, and then it can overlay all sorts of digital data on top. Um, so imagine you're at a basketball game and you're watching the basketball game. You know, it's it's. Uh, I think it's still more fun to be courtside and watch the real game. <laughs> but um, you know, you could use this to uh, like look around a little bit, and uh, again, all the stats would be laid over the players in real time, and you would know. Uh, you know, if, if you're a new basketball fan that walks in the stadium for the first time, you probably don't know who all the players are. You, you probably don't know their stats. You probably don't know what their what position they're playing. You you probably don't understand the strategy of the game at all. Well, here I could uh, say, hey, wear, wear this for about 20 minutes and, and you know, watch what, uh, what is shown on the screen, right. and all of a sudden you're learning, uh, you know, who, who all the players are and what their stats are and what they're good at and uh, what their percentage of free throws are and all sorts of fun stuff, right? Well, we, you know, it's interesting. In a, in a few weeks we are going to be doing a CXO talk show with the CIO of the NFL, yeah. so maybe we'll have to ask her For sure. about uh, yeah. about context. Well, uh, w one thing we learned in our book is they're losing a, a couple percent of the fans every year from the stadium to home, 
because now we have these big. I have a 70 inch TV, a, a, a high def C TV, and that's pretty common. Even in my poor friends' homes, they have big screens like that, right? Because that's they can't afford to go to the Ritz and stay in the Ritz and go, <laughs> you know, go out. So they they'll put all their resources in buying a thousand dollar TV, and then they can watch movies at home and and uh, music videos and all sorts of stuff like that, like football. And they're losing fans to home because uh, it's more fun to watch a football game at home than in the stadium, which yeah, that's is sort of the, counterintuitive, right? That's the real competition that the that all of the sports teams have these days. But we so have. What, what, what the New England Patriots is doing is, is they're putting beacons throughout the stadium. And, and uh, by the way, a lot of sports teams are doing this. I, I visited Sacramento Kings. They're putting uh, these beacons. Have you talked about beacons on your show before? No, we have, we have not. So these are um, – I, I have one on my key ring. Where's my key? Uh, whatever. It's a little radio that um, uh, spits three numbers into the air every second, and it costs uh, – uh, retail $30, uh, wholesale t less than $10. And uh, the Sacramento Kings have put 30 of these around the stadium. So when you walk in with your iPhone or your Android phone, uh, it knows how close it is to one of those beacons. So it knows exactly where you're standing, or pretty close to where you're standing. So they're thinking about using it uh, to, to do uh, paperless tickets. When you walk in, it's going to know you're there, so why do you need a ticket? It, it, you know, the ticket's on your phone. You bought it on, probably on a service on your phone. Why not just walk in the stadium and, and somebody could greet you at the door and say, hey, you know, hey, Michael, welcome to the Sacramento Kings. Thanks for being a fan. You well, know? We've, we've actually had uh, Fred Kirsch, who is effectively the chief digital officer of for the Patriots, the Patriots yeah. on our show. And so, and we'll be seeing him at an event, actually, that you're sponsoring. Uh, Weeks, so yeah, and on we August will... August 12th, we're actually asking. Uh, we've invited the CIOs of the Celtics, the Red Sox, the Bruins, the Patriots, all four teams from uh, Boston, as well as the uh, NFL CIO. And this is exactly what we're talking about with them, Robert. It's um, it's at Gillette Stadium, and it's the tech, it's technology and digital business transformation to improve the fan experience. Yeah, and it's really how do you leverage mobile, social, app, cloud technology uh, to learn all of them are doing it. I mean, I was talking to the lead singer of Lincoln Park last night. He invited me to to see what they're doing with tech. They're trying to do the exact same thing: G give a fan a better experience right. uh, for coming. Uh, you know, even if they're a hundred uh, meters away in a stadium, you know, because <laughs> a, a lot of us don't get to sit up front. <laughs> so, so how do you make this experience better? Well, everybody's carrying an iPhone. Why, why can't you put live video on the iPhone from special video cameras that are in the stadium so that you can see what what Mike looks like? Because if you're a hundred meters away, it, you know, he's a little dot up there on the stage, right? And and the New York England Patriots is doing that. They're putting special video cameras in the stadium just for the fans in the stadium, not not for the TV audience, for the people who are who actually paid $150 to come to the stadium. Right. You know? right. Absolutely. Oh. We we have a question, uh, another question from Twitter, and this, this is an interesting question, and it is from Gloria Lombardi, and Gloria asks, how will the age of context? impact the world of work? Where will the future of communication at work sit? It, it, it already is coming. I mean, I, uh, just yesterday, um, this uh, a calendar app that I use called Tempo uh, got updated. So Tempo came out of the same lab that the, the, the internet, you know, the SRI lab that where Siri came out of and uh, uh, the internet and all this stuff. And they're looking inside your calendar for context, because we, if you're at work, you're you're probably using Exchange, and you're probably putting everything, every meeting on your Exchange calendar. I, I use Google Calendar, but uh, one or the other, and and it looks inside your email for context. So if, uh, for instance, I put uh, one day I put a a, co a calendar item on my calendar, and it just said Flipboard. That's all it said. It didn't have an address. It didn't have anything else. And uh, Tempo found all the email that Mike McHugh and I have had. He's the CEO at Flipboard. Back and forth, uh, setting up this meeting. And then it went out to the internet and found the correct address because they had just changed to offices like two weeks before and put that on my calendar. And and uh, uh, if you have a uh, a conference call, it puts the, the right way to uh, do the um, numbers in there and stuff like that. It's uh, it's pretty cool. That's an example of, 
of where uh, an existing product gets better because of contextual systems underneath mm -hmm. that are working to make your life better. Google Now is another example. You know, as I walk around, like at Rackspace, once in a while, it'll tell me, uh, "Would you like to take control of this uh, TV, this projector in the t in the conference room?" Mm -hmm. And how did I know that? Oh, yeah, the projector has DLNA protocol. It's uh, it's exposing itself as an API, and Google now on my phone comes along and says, hey, there's something here. <laughs> you know, Why don't you take control of it? <laughs> and so that's uh, some of the things that I, I think are going to get better as businesses put beacons in their conference rooms and in their uh, lobbies and stuff like that because when you walk into a conference room, all of a sudden, uh, that room is going to know you're standing right, you're sitting there, and is going to be able to do stuff for you, make your life a little bit easier. So that's one said, example. You had said in a, in a recent post that, you know, we will know a hundred times more about our customers uh, than we do today, and the importance of data and analytical skills. So in terms of advice to future of work and companies, you know, should, should companies invest more in, in terms of training staff, or how do you how do you develop the skill, machine learning, and and and, and analytical uh, skills to be effective? That uh, hire people, uh, acquire companies that have those skills. It's a hard thing. It's a hard thing for startups. They're uh, they're if you know if you're a big data scientist right now, and, and you know how to build uh, machine learning systems. You, you have multiple job offers on the table at all times. Uh, Facebook wants you, Twitter wants you, Google wants you, Rackspace wants you, Amazon wants you, you know, and on and on. And every little startup needs you because that's how you add features to your to your product, right? Uh, back to the work thing. I, I don't know, know if you guys have had uh, Brett Taylor from Quip on, but uh, Quip is a new... Uh, um, I don't know that it's a word processor, but let's call it a word processor... It doesn't look like Microsoft Word. I mean, I, you know, uh, Microsoft Word usually is an entire document. You type it along and you format it and stuff like that. Here, you might just add a little tiny piece, and it just shoves that little piece over the over the network to everybody else. It's really uh, uh, pretty innovative, um, and that's an example. Mobile is changing how we work with each other. We're no longer sitting at desks. I, I was at a concert one time, and uh, some, some, somebody, a friend of mine, was always on her uh, phone. And I said, do people bother you because you're always on your phone? And she said, yeah, but the point is, uh, I, because I can work while at being at a conference or a concert, I can, do a, I can hang out with you. If I had to work the way I did 10 years ago, I'd have to stay at my desk in front of my screen because that's where my work is. Unbelievable. It's true. What about you know? What about driving? Let's talk about Waze. Ooh. Yeah, I love Waze. I love Waze too. So, <laughs> so, so first off, let's go back to basics. Explain why Waze is part of the the age of context. What's the context about Waze? Well, so just start well, from the beginning. Waze couldn't exist before uh, you know ten years ago. Um, it, it, Waze requires you to have your computing device in your hand, right? So once we have a computing device in our hand and we're driving with it, now we can have a map that shows uh, what other users are experiencing. So uh, when when I drove down to LA yesterday, I had Waze on the on the screen full time, and it, it showed me where accidents were, it showed me where the cops were, it, it showed me where other drivers sort of were because the the data about other drivers is obfuscated, but at least you could see that there's a bunch of drivers ahead of you, so you know that the data is pretty accurate and pretty uh, new. Uh, and you could even click on them and send them a message, but that's pretty goofy to do when you're driving. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but it, it really, uh, it, it does really awesome routing, and it was very accurate in predicting how long it would take to drive, drive from San Francisco down to L.A., and that gives you an example of of how our world has just changed in in a decade. You know, let's talk. But, about, but let's talk about cars. Uh, Waze is just a piece of what's happening in cars. Cars are um, are are sense. Uh, the car is uh, like the largest wearable computer you have, right? You it wraps <laughs> around you basically, <laughs> and it it has uh, modern car has I think thirty sensors on it. Uh, the Chevy Volt, for instance, that uh, my friend just bought, uh, creates a, a hundred or two hundred megabytes per second of data. 
Uh, now, most of that data is thrown away because a lot of it is for the the airbags and for the, the fuel control systems and all that stuff, and it's thrown away because it, it's needed for a couple microseconds and then uh, not needed, needed anymore. But look at what the Tesla studies. Did you, did you catch uh, when uh, Elon Musk, uh, who founded Tesla, um, was, com was um, uh, arguing with the New York Times, who had yes, just given yeah. Tesla a bad review? He had all the data about what the car ha had been used for. He knew that the uh, reviewer was doing donuts in the parking lot. He knew that the reviewer had turned up the heat full blast. He knew, he knew everything about the car, and, and that's one, one trend. The other trend is it's now being API. So I, I, a friend of mine wrote a Google Glass app for his dad's Tesla uh, where he can say something like, OK, Glass, where is my Tesla? And it shows right there. Uh, or OK, Glass, how much power is in my Tesla? And it says 30%, so you can only drive 100 miles. Uh, OK, Glass, and sitting in the car even, OK, Glass, open the moonroof, you know, something like that. And the moonroof opened up. And it's, um, it's pretty crazy. Uh, to think about the uh, uh, modern car as an API that you could write code against, but there's a company called Automatic that sells a little device, that, I think, for less than $100 that sticks underneath your dash, and there's an iPhone app or an Android app that goes along with it, and it tells you all sorts of stuff about your driving and about the car. You know, if the en check engine light comes on, it knows the code for that check engine light, and it puts it on your phone so you know what it means, and that's pretty cool. So, so, uh, so we, we won't, won't, we, don't, we, don't, we won't even, we, uh, sorry about that. We won't even waste time talking about self-driving cars because we're not going to get that. Well, I'm about to talk. It was funny. So, <laughs> so, so we don't, we don't have to remember phone numbers anymore. Uh, we don't have to learn direction to get to places. Soon we won't have to drive. Are we just going to become dumber as the contextual intelligence curve grows? Or do we just have more time to do things that only we can do and not machines? <laughs> yeah, that's up to you. You could get dumber and watch uh, the Kardashians on the screen in your car while the car drives you down, right? Do you remember or, phone numbers anymore? Do you remember I, phone numbers? I don't, what's I don't funny know is, phone number. What, what's funny is I remember... Uh, well, I remember my uh, my best friend's phone number from elementary school, and I haven't called him for 30 years. It's still stuck in my head, right? My uh, that's how your brain works. When you're young, you, your brain is forming, and and some things just stick there and, right, and take right. 50 brain cells away from uh, doing something more useful with it. But um, yeah, I don't remember phone numbers. I don't even I don't even know my wife's phone number. I, I always have to look at my phone to remember her phone number when somebody asks, "What's what's your wife's phone number?" <laughs> but is this any different from the advent of calculators when we stopped yeah. having to do mathematics? You know, addition, subtraction, division. Well, I, I had a chemistry teacher who who said, "You're allowed to use whatever tool you want in my uh, tests and my class." But you're going to be timed, <laughs> and if you didn't know the right formula, and you had to look it up and waste your time looking up, you know, looking through 50 formulas trying to remember which one was the right one for this problem, you were totally screwed. You were going to fail our class, and I, uh, I, I think I failed it once. <laughs> so I learned that lesson. You better actually learn the formula. Even if you have the calculator, because if you're wasting time looking through uh, your list of formulas for the, your for your uh, your your, uh, your molecular uh, uh, conversion or whatever, you're uh, screwed. <laughs> and um, actually, it's funny. I, you know, I just talked to a guy who got hired by Apple as a lawyer, and he said they they uh, part of the interview was they sat him in a room for an hour and said, "Okay, we want you to write up a contract with these attributes," and uh, and have it done in less than an hour. And, and that's sort of, uh, you know, the people who are productive and know their stuff are uh, going to be able to do that no problem at all. And somebody who faked it and uh, relies on the computer too much is sure. not going to be able to do that and not going to be able to, um, uh, you know, react to new challenges very quickly. Sure. So, so context and data gives us the foundation for making decisions, but it's not a substitute for either intelligence or good judgment. <laughs> no, and, and uh, um, 
you know, we will have a filter bubble. I, I've seen that on Facebook. If you click like on cat photos and nothing else, you're going to start seeing a lot of cat photos. Mm. You know, because it's going to find stuff that makes you happy. You know, and and yeah, their filters will stick in a random news event or something from your friends. But you're going to see your feed is going to have a lot of cat photos on it. My feed has a lot of tech stuff because that's all I click like on and comment on and share, right? And it's studying us. And and it's trying to addict us, you know. So so there is a filter bubble there, um, but that's why we also hang out with each other. You know, I hang out with you on the show and learn a lot of stuff. But that's why we go to parties. That's why we uh, go out with our friends who might not be into the same things we are. Uh, we're we're shoved into uh, proximity with each other, even people who are not in our filter bubble. And those those friends are what what's going to bring some randomness to our lives and, and a new experience, a better experience. We get bored after a while with the same thing. I, you know, I used to be really into cigars and whiskey, and lately I haven't been drinking that much So, because I got bored with it. Um, and so now I'm looking for a new experience, right? And, and the filter bubble will take a couple of weeks to figure that out. Oh, this guy's not drinking whiskey anymore. Uh, maybe he's... Uh, you know, uh, wants Italian food now constantly or something like that, right? So it'll take a while to reconfigure and, and bring that. In fact, so one of the problems with this contextual stuff is sometimes uh, the sensors are right, uh, but it, it brings you the wrong data. For instance, um, one of these uh, contextual apps that competes with uh, Google now, I won't name it so I, I don't get in trouble, but it kept telling me all sorts of stuff about golf classes and golf uh, lessons and uh, uh, golf deals, stuff like that, because I live on a golf course. So the sensor was right. I, I do live on a golf course. I spend a lot of time on a golf course, but I personally hate golf. And so, <laughs> I, you know, you need to be able to correct this stuff and say, no, 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 the, the sensor was right but wrong, you know, and, and it's not serving me well anymore. And sure. Stop showing me that stuff. I wish all ads had that, right? Right. Um, dude, that ad, that ad just is never going to get me. So, you know, stop showing that to me. <laughs> you know, and show me something else that might get me, you know. We have a question from Twitter. Yeah. And this is from Zachary Jeans. And it's a, we're shifting gears here. Yeah. And Zach, Zachary Jeans says, should conferences stream live events? And maybe more importantly, do you decide on where to speak based on whether they stream or not? Yeah. I, once in a while, I still have to go someplace that doesn't stream. It, it really does bug me. Um, you know, I, I've learned by... Um, um, I, 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 I uh, speak at a lot of events. And, I, and I, you know, even at the web, you're speaking to maybe 500 people in the audience in front of you, maybe 1,000 to 1,500 people. But when you watch the video and it gets online and 5,000 people watch it, you're like, uh, well, why not spend my time uh, going to the place that makes a platform for me to reach the entire world instead of, just the rich people that are sitting in the, in the seats. That's one way to look at it. Now, my wife and I used to run conferences, and we used to have this argument all the time. And, and the argument went, well, if we streamed our uh, content live, well, then no one would need to go to the conference. Uh -huh. And that's really not true, because really what conferences are for is the networking uh -huh. and, and uh, meeting afterwards and saying, OK, you said something really outrageous on stage, and I would need to unpack that. I need more detail to to localize it to my own company, uh, that's the that's what I get value out of going to conferences for. It's not the, necessarily just the content on the stage. The, the the content on the stage does matter. But like like I, I was fortunate enough to go to the TED conference one time, and the the conference the content on the stage is incredible, and yeah. it's better. It, it still is better live than it is on the video. I mean, you know, when you see a music event. It's better live than you know watching it on a, even my 70-inch TV with surround sound, right? Absolutely. Uh, but that's um, that's not the value of TED. The value of TED is uh, during lunch you get to talk to Bill Gates for 45 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and yeah. I haven't figured out any other way to talk to Bill Gates for 45 minutes. <laughs> that's really cool. Or or Meg Ryan or you know or you know I met the guy who uh, started uh, uh, you know 
uh, retail store, major retail store. <laughs> you know, it, it's just the people you meet at lunch are really interesting, and you learn things from them at lunch. And 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 I know many people who have gotten their companies funded at TED because that's. You know who goes to TED? Rich people. Oh, they have re they have money to invest in companies. Oh, right. hey, can I show you my company? <laughs> and a friend of mine walked away from TED with six million dollars. You know, so <laughs> not not too bad a, of an investment for seventy five hundred dollars to go to the to this TED conference. We have, we have another question from Twitter. Yeah, and from Phil Kamarni, who uh, has been a guest on CXO Talk. Uh, it's a former CIO and now CEO of uh, Startup. And he asks, how do you see context changing the way we educate students? Now that's an interesting one because uh, uh, education is changing quite a bit uh, thanks to online uh, systems like uh, lynda.com or Creative Live or uh, Khan Academy. There's a whole slew of them. That are trying to do online education, and even Stanford University, right? They put their class. I, I I know one professor who put his class online, and he has a hundred thousand students now. Right. So that radically changed what he was able to do as an educator. You know, uh, the scale of of that is just uh, pretty incredible. Um, there's, there's a professor. I'm not so there's sure. A... The context systems. If we get to the place where we we can learn online like that. Then the contextual system can study us as we learn and as we take online tests and as as we interact with uh, other uh, students and uh, other professors. Uh, and and it can say, okay, you're now ready for the next step. It can um, you know be almost like the gatekeeper uh, whether you move forward or not. There's a professor at Suffolk University that wears. Google Glass and students can type questions to him during lecture without having to raise their hand or bring attention to themselves. And he's actually improving engagement levels because people text him questions and he changes the lecture narrative based on the questions that are coming in. And yeah. he also, I believe, has ability to see the profile of the student who's asking the question, you know, while while giving a lecture. So I know at least one example where technology is being used, wearable technology, to better engage in a classroom. But, 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 but what I wanted to ask you is, as all of this awareness and in contextual intelligence grows, certainly privacy is going to dramatically change oh, yeah. in the future. And I read you talked about companies have to earn the trust in order for you to give them permission to learn more about you. And you used Uber well, as an example. Uh, I, and you said, give a utility first, ask for permission second. And um, so I wanted to learn a little bit. And you used the, I think you mentioned Mark Andreessen's Use free ice cream as an example, a metaphorical example of you know getting people to exchange information for ice cream. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your views on privacy? And answer fast, yeah. Robert, because we're almost done, and we have at least one more Twitter question. So oh, yeah. ask me the hardest question <laughs> when I have a <laughs> minute. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, privacy is such a deep uh, thing, and, and when when you say privacy, everybody has a different idea of what they mean. I, Keep in mind, e even me, I'm all public. I, I don't mind uh, giving you my phone number and, and my email, but I'm not going to give you the password to my bank account. <laughs> that was so, going to be the next question. No. But, but to me, there's still even in my world, always in. I call it the always in world, and in fact, there's a new digital divide coming between people like me and like I had dinner with Richard Stallman and he's wearing a button that says pay cash for everything stay off the grid kind of thing you know don't be on Facebook don't don't you know don't give any data to any company because they're gonna study the, the hell out of you and do stuff you know and I'm on the other side it's like I want this the companies to study me and give me good stuff you know uh, trip it for instance saved me a night in Chicago because I give it my credit card and access to my Gmail which is a Huge shift in privacy belief uh, over you know if you told me 15 years ago that I would give uh, at access yeah. to my email system to a third party startup I would uh, which now is owned by a big public company called Concur I would say you're nuts <laughs> yeah but 15 years later now I'm like rah rah let's go give me more um, that's amazing so so uh, privacy is really under uh, a shift right now to this newer world where we're going to give it a lot of data to make it work well 
uh, I, I sat next at a concert. I, I sat next to an insurance salesman from Chicago who didn't know who I was. So he was just like, "Hey, have you seen this Google now thing?" <laughs> and I go, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool, isn't it?" And I didn't tell him I wrote a book on it or anything. <laughs> and he's like, "You know, this thing is so cool. I'm giving it more data so it works better." <laughs> and I'm going, "Yes, uh, you're joining the always on, uh, always in, all in re revolution." The all problem right. is we're in a a, a shift and. The three things that I tell companies uh, are, one, be transparent with your data, what you're collecting on it. So Google is actually doing a pretty good job of that. They have a privacy dashboard that you can search for, and it shows you everything. Uh, be uh, correctable. That's the golf uh, uh, example. And three is uh, l let me shut it off. Uh, the guys who make um, my jackets, uh, Scotty Vest, actually makes a pocket that is transmission-proof to try to hack that, right? Um, and or uh, remove the consequences of studying my data. For instance, if I have a basis watch on, it has a heart rate sensor and a perspiration sensor, right, uh, and a clock. Well, if uh, my wife and I are, uh, you know, having some fun in bed, it, it, all of a sudden <laughs> that thing knows. <laughs> and, and what are the consequences of it knowing that? I don't know. And we have to discuss that and build systems to protect us from the consequences of data that we don't want other people to know, maybe. Okay, so we have one final question from Twitter. And this is, this is actually an important question, I think, another one related to education. And this is from Stephen DiFilippo, who is uh, another higher education CIO and actually a former guest on CXO Talk. And so he asks, what about technologies like iBeacon in education? Any thoughts on that? And again, we're running out of time, so, so come yeah, quick. Yeah, that's a hard one, because we're still figuring out what, what it means at a sports stadium, much less <laughs> what it means in a classroom. Uh, keep in mind, almost all the audiences I speak to, none of them know that uh, your iPhone has a beacon in it. Um, uh, Android does not yet have beacon, uh, beacon transmit capability. Android can see the beacon and uh, sense how close it is to a beacon. But it, actually, all the Apple products have uh, a beacon built into the uh, product, and iBeacon is the software layer on top of the... It's The actual technic technical term is uh, Bluetooth Smart... Uh, beacon, right? Um, anyways, where am I going with that? If you're in the classroom, all of a sudden you know you're in the classroom because uh, your phones can see each other, the teacher can see that you're uh, there, the attendance, uh, why do an attendance role? You know, everybody's here. We, uh, I already know that. <laughs> um, and on and on. We haven't even yet started dreaming about what this new beacon thing means because we don't even know we have one already. Uh, and we don't know that the sports stadium we're walking into has one already. And, like, I, I went to Coachella, big music festival. They had uh, several on the field uh, set out, and, and a lot of people are carrying iPhones. So we haven't even started thinking about how to use it at a sports stadium or a museum or a retail store yet. Retail stores are actually getting uh, fairly built yeah. out already. But Absolutely. We, we're, we, we haven't even started dreaming about this stuff yet because right. it's too new. And uh, so even me, I need to think about that one. <laughs> That's not something I can come up with right away. It's amazing. Right. I, I, I believe in retail it will become, you know, Apple will probably have an iWallet, an iBeacon, Bluetooth, low energy technology will get you rebates and it will combat showrooming. And you'll get, when Robert Scoble walks in, he's going to get a big, bigger discount because... The retailer will know immediately you have an influencer on premise, get you a rebate that's more than the average person. And so we're going to go I, shopping with Robert. Re, are right. we going to go shopping? But right. I'm so, so I think Beacon in retail will is the only way you can combat showrooming and actually take advantage of revenue per person on premise. Yeah. And that's where the contextual stuff is going to absolutely matter in a big way, in my view. Yeah. I, you know, uh, I don't think it's about discounts either. Uh, when, when I went to uh, Castello di Amorosa Winery, a big winery up in Napa, uh, mm -hmm. next to me was the CEO, and he was uh, dealing with a famous actor. And I had the vice president of comms showing me around. <laughs> so there's a pecking order to everybody. Everybody has a pecking <laughs> order, right? Mm -hmm. And so you walk in, and uh, everybody can be uh, serviced better because mm -hmm. they know something about you. Oh, you like Skrillex? Oh, let's uh, talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'd love to go shopping with Robert. Yeah, all right. So we're going to go. We're gonna go we're gonna I go hate shopping, shopping. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
Well, this has been a very interesting show. We've been talking with Robert Scoble, who is, his official title is the Startup Liaison Officer at Rackspace. And he just, well, it's not, not so recently anymore. When, when did your book, Age of Context, uh, get released? About Last six, September. Last and it's, uh, yeah, it's still, a, it, it, there's still a lot to happen because uh, we're, we're just, uh, we're in the beginning, uh, beginning era of this stuff. Uh, you know, we're we're still figuring out. Since the book got published, uh, Beacons came on scene, right? So it, it's happening, and it's uh, quite exciting. So mm -hmm. time to update the book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, hopefully Great. you come back. This was one of the fastest hours I've experienced in a long time. So very fast. Thank you very much, Robert. Th thank you very much, and uh, see you on the internet. You got yeah, it. <laughs> on the on the interwebs, in the, in the words of George Bush. <laughs> See you in those tubes, man. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, said the, tu the internet's are tubes. <laughs> exactly. The interwebs and the intertubes. <laughs> so, uh, so next week, we are going to be joined by Sonny Hashimi, who is the Chief Information Officer of the General Services Administration. And it's going to be a fun show. Amazing. He's a great CEO. Paul, it's good to see you. Good to see you let's, as well. Here, no, let's do like a, yeah. But it's, uh, you know, the thing yeah, is, yeah, is, no one can see yeah, it because that's all right. it's the camera. We're actually, Vala and I sit in the same room. We're like three feet apart. Um, yeah, don't let the secret out. That Our hangout yeah. is really in the same room. But anyway. So, well, thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you, Robert Scoble, for being our wonderful guest this thank week. You. And we hope you have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.